The title of my message today is what it means to be born again. Amen. What it means to be born again. So in John chapter 3, we're going to read from verses 1 to 8. And the Bible says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to uh, gather together, to uh, read your word and expound upon it. Uh, Lord, I pray that uh, this message uh, may resonate with your people. Uh, Lord, just take me out of it. I pray that your word may shine through this and uh, pray that we may uh, really examine this very deep and uh, powerful passage of scripture. And I just pray that you may be with everyone in this room. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. So to be born again, this is a common term that we hear within Christianity, a very biblical term, obviously, and uh, it may seem simple to some and uh, intricate or complicated to others. But like I said in the, before I started, we want to know what the Lord means by these terms. It's essential to understand because the Lord Jesus says in verse 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So I, I would say that it's quite important for us to really know what this means. Right. It says, so um, the prerequisite to seeing God's kingdom is the reality of being born again. So what does it mean to be born again? Nicodemus, this man who was a ruler of the Jews, a, a Pharisee. Remember uh, last service I talked to you guys about the Pharisees who were a very zealous, very devout denomination of Judaism at this time. And uh, the Bible says there are Pharisees who believed in Jesus. Most of them tended to keep it down low. So they wouldn't be, um, you know, persecuted or, or kicked out of their group. And while being born again is a supernatural work of God, it is a spiritual phenomenon that not only changes your life upon this earth, but it also determines the eternity of every person. So Nicodemus was viewing this in a physical realm, in a physical dimension. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? He wasn't understanding that Christ was approaching this teaching from a spiritual level. So we should also seek to understand the teachings of Jesus on a spiritual level. Uh, before I go into some points of what being born again actually implies, I want to really exposit this passage, just these eight verses, to help us have a better understanding. Because this is probably the most popular chapter in the Bible. So I think, I think we really need to take our time and really understand what's going on. So in verses 1 to 2, we see that Nicodemus, the man of the Pharisees, a ruler of the Jews... In verse number two, it says, he came to Jesus by night. This may have been due to the fact that he didn't want his religious group to see him affiliated with Christ. Now, Nicodemus may have believed in Jesus. Maybe he sincerely wanted to follow him. But oftentimes, we can feel a sense of shame for following the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see through Nicodemus that he even has a great respect for Jesus. He wouldn't just go around calling everyone rabbi, right? That was a very sincere word within the Hebrew culture in a way of saying, you're a teacher, you're a master, you have knowledge. 
And Nicodemus had this great sense of respect for Jesus, saying that he must come from God because nobody can do what you are doing. That's what he's saying to Jesus. And yet Nicodemus didn't understand what Christ came to this earth to do. And that is to save sinners. So in verse number three, our Lord says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I always thought it was fascinating in this passage how Jesus seems to really abruptly cut off Nicodemus and what he's talking about. And he delivers to him one of the most powerful statements in the entire Bible. And rather than continuing in a conversation led by Nicodemus, he decides to bring it back to the gospel. Now that's a great illustration for us as well, that no matter who we're able to talk to, no matter who God puts in our life, we should seek to bring the gospel into the conversation. So Nicodemus says, Rabbi, I know you're a teacher. I know you come from God. I know you do all these amazing works and miracles. And Jesus says to him, did you know that if you're not born again, you can't see God? (coughs) Now that's a pretty, pretty abrupt way of stopping a conversation and leading it to the truth of the gospel. But it shows you that if you lead someone to the deep spiritual truth of Christ, that conversation can be life-changing. And that sinful man had to have been born again. And this is a good example for us as we seek to bring the gospel to whoever we speak to. Because the gospel, the Bible says, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Now in verse number four, Nicodemus is approaching Christ through this physical realm, as I explained to you. But Jesus says in verse number five, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, throughout the few thousand years of of our faith and different denominations arguing things, this verse has often been used to implicate that baptism would be part of you being born again. Because Jesus says, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. I know, it's pretty far-fetched, right? Especially because it's already been established that they're in 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 a physical you know, application of this. Really what that means is you're born of water. So what happens when a woman is pregnant and she has a baby? What breaks? Her water. Right. So accept that you're born physically and that you are born spiritually to God's family. You cannot enter the kingdom of God. Right. That's what the Bible says. And uh, Jesus says in uh, verses number six to seven that that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So you see why I tell you, let Jesus explain the teaching to you, because he can explain it better than any philosopher or theologian can. Uh, He's explaining the importance of being born again as a spiritual phenomenon. This is something that exists outside of this physical world. And uh, in verse number eight, Jesus says, the wind bloweth where it listed, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh. And whither it goeth, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Now the phenomenon of being born again is that it happens in a moment of time. That's the supernatural aspect to it. A lot of people think being born again is a lifelong process. That's going to take me my entire life. And and I can never really know if I was born. But isn't it funny how on your birth certificate it'll say, well, I, I don't know how they did it when you guys were born. But even on mine it says the time I was born. So March 17, 1997, 12.37 a.m. That moment in time is when I was brought into this world. Now, why would God use a physical illustration but to help us understand a spiritual truth? The fact that once your spirit is born again in a moment of time, you go from belonging to the world to God. If there hasn't been a moment in time where your spirit has been born again, that moment has not happened. That's according to the word of God. Amen? Amen. And what comes with that breeze of the wind, uh, it's, it's like the Lord is comparing a breath of wind to the spirit of God indwelling a believer. Now, we don't see the wind. The only reason we may see it is because we see trees and leaves blowing and we feel it. But you can't necessarily tell me, you know, what wind is. It's just air moving, right? Just as the Spirit of God moves in to the body of the believer, 
who puts their faith in Jesus Christ at that moment in time. So what does being born again imply? Point number one is that being born again implies that you are born into God's family. In John chapter 1, verse 12, the Bible says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So when we're born physically into this world, we're born into a physical family. We have a mother, we have a father, sometimes we have siblings. <laughs> uh, but ultimately, there comes a point in every person's life where they must realize that they sin. And that this sinful consciousness is brought upon them because God has written his law upon our hearts. And once your sin, one sin, will separate you from God. A lot of people don't like to hear this type of preaching, right? Because I don't know what it is about human beings, but we tend to always want to look at people that are worse than us, right? Oh yeah, I may have done this and this, but at least I've never killed anyone. You know, we don't think about the fact that we've treated people poorly. We haven't loved our neighbor as ourselves. We have not loved God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, which is the first commandment. I like that the first commandment is the absolute hardest because it kind of sets the precedent, right? Um, and uh, sin cannot enter into the presence of God because he's a holy God. But luckily for us, God has the answer. And he himself did the work for us. You must enter into God's family and become his child to return home to him for all of eternity. So how is one born into God's family? The Bible has the answer. It's by faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now what is the gospel? Born again, gospel. These are terms you may have heard throughout your entire life, but it's important to actually understand why you believe what you believe. The gospel isn't necessarily a concept or an idea. It is a reality. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul explains what the gospel is. That he didn't receive this from men. He received this from God. And the gospel is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So to be born into the family of God, Galatians chapter 3 verse 26 has a simple and powerful answer in which it says, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Now, if God wants you to spend eternity with him in bliss and in the most perfect place you could ever imagine, and then even more perfect than that, do you think he would make this something incredibly difficult for you? Because the Bible says God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So as Brother Ray was saying earlier with his Presbyterian friend, different denominations and different theologies have kind of constructed their own ideas of, uh, honestly, of, of who God is and what God's desire is. But the Bible says that he is not our Savior only, but also the Savior of the whole world. So Christ came to this earth and died for the sins of every single person. The only difference is, you don't become a child of God just because Christ did that. You become a child of God by accepting the fact that Christ did that. So the gift is there. It's waiting for you. You just have to pick the gift up. Being born again implies that you are born into God's family. And 1 John chapter 5 says in verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? When one is born again, they truly become a child of God. This means that God becomes their father. And the fellowship, the relationship, is now one with no condemnation. Because God is your father, and you are God's child. And rather than being in this world, and by extension the devil's hand, right, when we look around this world, what do we see? But I think the devil's working overtime today. Yeah. You are now in God's family. And since God is the greatest father, you will forever be his child. And you receive the blessings of being God's child. In Romans chapter 8, 
verse 16, says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Don't you love how often the Bible uses present tense verbiage? I think that's great because it just shows you that this book was not just written for whoever was reading it at that time. Yeah. This was written for all people throughout all ages yeah. and all times. So just as it applied to the saints back here in this part of church history, it applies to us as well. Right. The same blessings, the same faith. The faith once delivered to all saints is what the Bible says. Just as they were born again, we must be born again. Yeah. And if you have not been born again, please be born again. Because it's your choice. We may not have chosen to be born into this world. But there is a purpose for why you were born into this world. It is so that you could be born to God and his family for all of eternity. Because in retrospect, 70, 80, 90, 100 years on this earth, what does James say? It's a, a vapor. It's gone, just like that. But eternity is what we should set our eyes upon. Point number two of being born again is that being born again implies the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So once you're born into God's family, God doesn't leave you alone on this earth. He sends his spirit to indwell you here on this earth. To teach you, to show you the truth of the Bible, and to edify you, to build you up. Also, he will rebuke you when you must be rebuked. Because what kind of parent wouldn't discipline his child when they're in disobedience? But since God is a perfect father, he will discipline us when we need to be disciplined. Now go to Ephesians chapter 1. Or write down in your notes Ephesians chapter 1. And it says in verse 13, In whom ye also trusted. Now this is talking about our Lord Jesus. It says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of Amen. promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Let me just park it there, kind of help you understand this a little more. Has anyone here ever bought a house? Has anyone here ever had to put down an earnest deposit? Yeah, what does that mean? It means that you're serious about purchasing this property right here. What God does with your soul is he puts a down payment on it just to show you he is serious about his promises. God is not a man that he should lie. When God makes the promise of eternal life to everyone that believeth, he actually means it. We may go back on our promises because we're sinful people. That doesn't even cross God's mind to break his promises. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, the Bible says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Right. See, those tenses in the Bible are really important to pay attention to. In verse 1, Paul says, ye were sealed. So it happened. And then in verse uh, chapter 4, he says, you are sealed. So I was, I am, and I will be. That just shows you the seriousness of God. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. You know what, what else that shows us is that we can grieve the Spirit of God. Because once you are born into God's family, does that mean you'll always do what God wants you to do? Yeah, I don't think so either. But it shows us that we have the choice to serve God and to love God. Or we have the choice to disobey God. And you will receive different rewards or different punishment for that. On, on this earth, God will chastise his children who do not serve him and love him. And once you're born again, you still have free will. You still have your own choices to make. I want to show you a verse in Romans chapter 8. One more time. Romans chapter 8. In verse 9 where it says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Right. So what comes with God's possession over you is the Spirit of God indwelling his temple, which is your body. Now, do you see how important it is to be born again? 
it may seem like something hard to hear, and uh, I think a lot of preachers are scared to talk about this issue. They, they want to keep things kind of surface level today in modern Christianity. But the fact of the matter is, you either belong to God, or you belong to Satan. And the sad part is, Satan is deceptive, so most people that belong to him don't know they belong to him. But you know what? Every believer of God who has been born again knows that they belong to God. Because God is not deceptive. God is transparent, he's clear, when he makes a promise, he means it. Think about the fact that God says, you can choose life or death. You can choose blessings or cursing. You can choose the cleansing blood of Christ, or you can die in your sin. I know. It's hard to hear. It's hard to say. But that just shows you the truth of God's word, that if I were to keep this information from you, that would be a big problem. Because what Pastor said in church this morning was, it's the preacher's responsibility to preach the whole counsel of God. So I can't just preach to you God and his love. I also have to tell you the truth about Satan. And also have to tell you the truth about hell. But the good news is, God doesn't want you to go there. Did you know that we weren't made for hell? That was reserved for who? The devil and his angels. Man was supposed to spend eternity with God. The problem is, man stumbled, fell, and he fell out of God's presence at that moment in time. That's why you must be born again. And Jesus says in John chapter 8, You shall die in your sins if you believe not that I am he. You shall die in your sin. The truth has to be spoken. And do you see how important it is to be born again? So what are the points? Point number one, being born again implies being born into God's family. Point number two, being born again implies the spirit of God dwelling within the body of every believer. And lastly, point number three, being born again implies assurance. This is a topic a lot of people don't talk about today, assurance of salvation. And the reason most people don't want to talk about this issue is because there's always a little bit of works put in the back. Because what kind of religion or organization would prosper by just telling you, God did all the work for you, it's a free gift? They wouldn't benefit from that. Who's going to give them their tithe? So the preacher can buy his new house and his new jet and his new boat while his people are working, trying to make ends meet, right? But being born again implies assurance of salvation. Now, we shouldn't serve God out of fear for hell. We should serve God because he loves us. Amen. And he gave himself for us. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 in verse number 9. I'm just going to go back to this. It says, You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. In 1 John chapter 5, this is personally my favorite chapter in the whole Bible. So if you want to read it on your own time, feel free. 1 John chapter 5. Verses 10 to 13 say, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. Yeah. Who's the witness? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, that's exactly right. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Amen. Do you see... The fact that God hath given to us eternal life will not be a, a, a passage of scripture that a lot of religion wants to teach you. Because they want to teach you that God may give you it. He may give you if you're a good enough boy or girl. And, you know, it kinda, it's kind of silly. The whole works-based religion is really silly when you, when you take a step back and look at it. Because when I was a Roman Catholic, I did not have assurance of salvation at all. Because I never knew if I prayed enough. I never knew if I took part in enough sacraments. I never knew if I said enough rosaries. I just couldn't know. So when people say that you can be saved but not have assurance, I don't know about you, Brother Red, but I want to see that. Yeah. 
I want to see a case where, where, where that is so. Because if I'm not sure of where I'm going, do I trust in God or do I trust in me? So in that world, is God God or am I God? I'm making myself a God. Because I'm thinking my own self and my own being is sufficient to spend eternity in perfection and in true holiness. It's not possible. And I, I just don't buy it when people say, you can be saved but not have assurance. Because when I was a lost man, I was not saved. I said I believed in Jesus. I said I believed he died on the cross for me. I believed that he died and rose again. But I didn't come to God on his terms. No. And that was the problem. And I don't know about you, Brother Ray. Maybe, maybe this happened to you too. When I got saved, it's as if that moment of time, everything about my life changed. Everything about my mentality changed. I said, I seriously woke up and I read the Bible and it, I actually understood it. Yeah. Amen. And I actually knew when I was driving to work, it was a day like this, but a lot worse. If I died right now, I would be with God. And that moment in time changed everything about my life. That's why I, I am burdened to share this with people. Because without his grace, it's not possible. That's, right. that's all we need. And that's, we just have to accept the fact that God has it under control and it's on his own terms. So John chapter 6, verse 47, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And I want to show you one more verse that just came to my heart. This is a verse I heard in a message that popped up on YouTube. This is actually how I became a believer in Christ. I heard a sermon about assurance of salvation. That's why this is one of my, my favorite things to, to study in the Bible. And funny enough, uh, that sermon is what God used to give me eternal life through his word and give me assurance of salvation. Jesus says in John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. When I heard the preacher say hath everlasting life, I took, um, I had like a, a NASB Catholic Bible, and I noticed that any time it uses the, uh, the tense has or hath, that Bible will say will have. Or um, um, when it talks about being saved, it's that you are being saved, not that you are saved, right? And then I also had a King James Bible. I don't know even where I got it. I really don't. Uh, maybe uh, my wife's grandma or something gave it to her. I don't know. And I would go and compare these verses. And whenever I read the King James, it would say that you have eternal life. You are saved. And then when you compare that to what the original manuscripts say, it's word for word. Exactly right. And that's when I got into studying the Bible. Right? Yeah. So I'd study the Bible in Bosnia. And it would say the same thing that King James said. Because they come from the same family of manuscripts. That's why it's important. Do you think Satan stops deceiving you know, just in this world? Or does he try to attack God and his work? Yeah. Of course he does. But if we have the Spirit of God within us, the Bible says he will show us all truth. Amen? And when I was lost, I wasn't trusting in the Savior. I was trusting in the sinner. The moment I stopped trusting the sinner and started trusting the Savior, he gave me assurance. Amen. In that very moment. So... Uh, if you didn't know that God is your father and you'll spend eternity with him because you trust in Christ, God isn't your father. But if you know that by faith in Jesus Christ, you are part of the family of God, there's nothing that can separate you from his love, from the love of God, from the promises of God. And once you're born again, there's nothing that can separate you from him, from his family, and except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So what does being born again imply? You're a child of God. You have the spirit of God dwelling within you. And you have assurance Amen. of your salvation. Amen.